Hey everyone, thank you for joining us. We have a great show for you. Today we're going to be exploring the mind of a stalker. We see a hit TV show now is out there talking about stalking. So we're going to explore the mind of a stalker with Dr. Hickey. He is the Dean of the California School of Forensic Studies at Alliant International University. Welcome to The Circle, Dr. Hickey. Thank you. Good to be here. So now it's starting to become, I wouldn't say mainstream, but the stalker show is becoming quite popular. What is a stalker? What, what goes on in their minds? Well, there, there certainly are different types of stalkers. There's domestic stalking. We often think of stalking as a domestic issue, an ex-girlfriend or an ex-boyfriend, ex-husband. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, but yet there's a lot of stranger stalking as well that goes on. And now with the Internet, of course, uh, stalking has become almost, as you say, mainstream. There's so much of it that goes on. And there's a, it's, it's, it's on a spectrum, if you, if you want to look at it, because uh, stalking um, is ultimately about control. It's about controlling other people. And, and uh, uh, unfortunately, um, you can be anybody what, that you want to be on, on the Internet. I personally have been stalked by a couple of people, well, three people now over the, in my career. Uh, but uh, one was a, a mental patient, psychiatric patient, and uh, she was very dangerous, and she told me that she, when I first met her that she was going to kill me, and two, two years later, she almost did. Um, and then I was also stalked by a student on campus for about six months, uh, and she was had some mental health issues, and eventually we were able to get that under control. Um, and, and I'm probably the only person in the United States that doesn't mind being stalked because I put them in my next book. Uh, but it, it's not it's not a comfortable feeling knowing that there's someone who is hiding behind trees or is always sending you text messages or calling you and so on. Most people who have been stalked don't realize they've been stalked. I'll ask my students, how many here have ever been stalked? And you know, just a few hands will go up. And then I'll say, well, how many here have ever received any unwanted gifts, unwanted telephone calls? And I don't mean from, from uh, bill collectors, but I mean from strangers or from an ex-boyfriend or you've received unwanted home visits and so more and more people put up their hands because I said well you have been stalked if it's on, on an ongoing basis so what we try to do is help people understand the etiology of stalking and and then what you can do is best best practices to confront it because stalking is not about being fair stalking is about survival most stalking does not end up in physical harm but psychologically, it is extremely damaging, whether it's domestic or stranger. That's because of the fear factor that, I, that it causes the uh, victim. Absolutely. The fear factor is, is, is huge. And I have many cases of uh, both stranger and domestic stalking that we can discuss. So what is, what is going on in the mind of these stalkers? We talked about the pedophiles that seem to have self-esteem issues. Uh, their social skills are lacking. Um, what's going on with a stalker? Well, again, your uh, is a very broad category. When you say stalkers, there's um, there's different you, under domestic. There's different types of domestic stalking. You can get people who are just nuisance stalkers. Um, they, they'll bother you on the internet, and as soon as you tell them to knock it off, they'll they'll, they'll leave you alone. Uh, how about there, the ones that are? Uh, how about the ones that are dangerous to the everyday population? Because I know the celebrity stalkers. I think they're probably more delusional or more in a fantasy kind of world. Yes. What about the ones that, that can affect the general population, an innocent college student? Yes. The ones who are the, the most dangerous of all stalkers are in stranger stalking. When we talk about stranger stalking, now domestic stalking is also very dangerous. When we talk about stranger stalking and we focus on uh, predators who are into stalking, um, that is extremely harmful because they, they often will end up in, in, in assaults and so on. Uh, give you give you an a couple of examples of... Uh, I have a case where the uh, victim was a, a school bus driver, and she started getting. She was living with a roommate, and she started getting uh, teddy bear, uh, little notes, little notes left on her doorstep early early morning, and she thought the notes were from her from a news, newspaper boy, so she started writing back to him, and eventually. Um, she started getting little gifts, uh, teddy bear or other other small gifts, and she thought that was rather strange that a 12-year-old would be giving her gifts. So she got up early one morning and met the paper boy, and he said, "Ma'am, I'm 12 years old. I don't I don't buy anybody gifts. It's not me." 
And so then she realized that she was being stalked. So she um, um, decided that she was going to move. And so she moved away with her parents for a while. Then she moved back when she thought this coast was clear. Well, then the notes began again. And, the, and, more, and more gifts and more advanced gifts and more elaborate gifts, you know, a leather coat and you know, larger gifts and so on. Uh, and then one day, she, um, there was a box at, the, at her back door. And she opened it, and it was a diamond ring with a note that said, we are now engaged. You will wear this ring, or I will kill you on the school bus with all the children. And so she was faced with a dilemma. I always ask my students, well, what would you do? Would you wear the ring? And students, some, some would say, well, I would never wear it. And other students say, well, I would definitely wear it. Well, yeah, it's a very difficult. Obviously, the police had been involved many times in this case, but stalkers don't leave return addresses. And it was a stranger case, and so they obviously they wanted to do so much. Um, they tried their very best to, to find who it was. Uh, unable to do so, she wore the ring for s several months. Um, then, on the anniversary of the one-year date from her first note on her doorstep, a uh, UPS uh, man arrives with, with a package for her. She opens the door, and he passes her this clipboard to sign for it. And on the note, I mean, on the board, it simply said, happy anniversary. He was the stalker. Now, he didn't work for UPS, and yet he had a UPS uniform on. And when she realized that he was the stalker, she went to slam the door, and he pushed his way in. He grabbed her, he tied her up, and he said, uh, I, I, I want the ring back. This guy was 20, about 27 years old, handsome. Um, and so she, he went and got the ring off the table, and he came over to her, and she's, she thinks she's going to die. So she's very traumatized, and he gives her a kiss on the cheek, and he says, look, I, I, you know, I want you to know that we're going to become best friends. I'm, 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 I'm coming back for you, and that we're going to be together forever. Um, and, and so he walked out and left her there tied up. A few hours later, her roommate comes in and finds her. Of course, she's very traumatized now, and uh, so she moves out and moves back with her parents. A year later, at her home with her parents, where she thought she was safe, uh, she received a, a dozen uh, a dozen roses from the stalker saying, I just want you to know that I'm still here, I'm still watching you, and I am coming back for you. Now, you can imagine her life. She can never be normal again. I mean, she can never have total comfort in being in the public sector. Now, the, the, one of the questions was, uh, to me, when I, when I interviewed her, uh, she was worried that he was going to kill her. I said, no, 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 he was never going to kill you. If he wanted to kill you, you would have died a long time ago. The truth is, he probably has multiple victims, and he enjoys the control over you. But he does, and he doesn't know you. He just likes to. He probably followed you home one day from work and started doing this to you. But he has no intention of killing you. But of course, by then, of course, she was she was carrying a gun, and you know she was planning on taking matters into her, own, into her own hands. We get a lot of stuff like that going on, um, and, and and women can fight back against this sort of thing. But I always tell people, you need to document. The moment you realize that something's wrong, you must document it. And you must notify the police. You, you, must, take, um, you must be proactive in protecting yourself. I know it's uncomfortable. It might be uh, disrange, your, disrange your whole life. But it is about your life. I know women who moved out of state just to hide from their stalkers. So um, it is what it is. And we have, to, we have to confront it for what it is. Welcome to Adelante. This is Adelante Recovery, and my name is Yvette Kuglin, and I'm part of the staff. Adelante Recovery Center has helped people in dual diagnosis for five years. We accept most PPO insurances and provide luxury accommodations and 24-hour support. To speak with an admissions counselor, call 1-888-242-4450. A lot of time we don't even know what's wrong with us and sometimes we need to get away to figure that out. So if you want to go for a little retreat out in Corona Del Mar, which is a confidential location, we're here to help. So we're only a phone call away. Thank you. Is it more difficult, I don't know if where this was in a rural town or in, a, in an urban town or an urban environment, but is it more difficult in an urban setting for them because there's so many more cameras, like in New York City, 
be much more challenging for them. Challenging for the stalkers? Yeah, because they'd be seen by the cameras or a lot more traffic in an urban setting. Is this more of a rural kind of setting environment no, for the stalkers? This was, a, this was in a city, but uh, this was a few years ago. Now there are more cameras. Um, but <laughs> it's interesting about cameras that people feel safer because they there are cameras. But predators find ways around that. And we see a lot more cyber stalking going on. And, and men who are hacking into, into, into women's... Um, or to women and children's uh, computers and, and taking their photographs and a lot of people will do these sexting and they'll put pictures of their sexual organs on and they'll say pictures of themselves naked and having sex and so and hackers will get in and get that information and put put it up in the web or threaten to do it and blackmail them and um, it, all of that is just bad. I always tell people, you know, you, you need to be careful what you put on, put on Facebook and then on the internet because it will come back to haunt you later on. Um, so yes, um, there are challenges, I suppose, uh, publicly following people, but there's uh, many ways to follow someone today with technology that we didn't have before. Stalkers can uh, place things on your cars, they can, they can monitor your, your car your car movement, and they can, they can know where you are at all times. Um, there are just some very unique, interesting ways that technology has provided for stalkers as well as for law enforcement to investigate them. They also use those same, same kind of tools. So really, I guess we're not as safe then. We're going to be much more vigilant than we are. I, I think that the only, the only protection we have is to be vigilant and not to assume that the government will, will protect us. It's not that the government doesn't want to. They just can't. We have to, we have to protect ourselves. And that's what we're here for: is to, is to support each other, and to and to stay stay alert and to be aware of our surroundings and and don't don't make assumptions that that everyone's going to be nice to us because sometimes they're not. In our last five minutes here, um, I wanted to tackle. Hopefully, they're not too large subjects. One of them is the media misrepresentation going on. Do you think all all these crime drama shows that are going on out there, Criminal Minds, uh, Law and Order? Are they desensitizing the public, and are they misrepresenting what's going on? There is a great deal of misrepresentation by these crime shows, and it doesn't mean that they aren't based sometimes on true cases, uh, but they are. there is always an entertainment portion to any kind of crime show that, ha that has to be entertaining to the public to keep their attention. And, of course, we know that crimes are not committed uh, and solved, and resolved within 42 minutes or, or, or 25 minutes, uh, take out the commercials. So we have to think about that as, as they are misleading. And, and I, I don't watch those shows because I'm such a critic of them. And, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, you can learn some things from crime shows, certain, certain crime shows. But I always remember that it's there for entertainment purposes. I think that we, we've mainstreamed it. People like to be armchair detectives. They want to sit there and, you know, they're fascinated by it. Uh, but the truth is that that doesn't mean that, mean that you're safer because just because you watch it on television. There are offenders who do these types of things, and, and they're, they're real people, and they commit real crimes. Um, I think that we like to get close to the edge and look over and see what's there. It's always fascinating. We like the dark side. Everyone likes, they're all, everyone's fascinated by the dark side. And I always have in all my career. Uh, but I, I'm very much interested in protecting people and, and saving people's lives and understanding offenders and how either to treat them or to lock them up forever. Uh, I, I, I don't underestimate their, their capabilities. So um, uh, sometimes it's just like going to a zoo and thinking, oh, well, I can get close to the bears and take pictures of them. Well, try it. They will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> As we've seen lately. People hop into zoos. They, I mean, they go to a zoo and they hop into a cage. They think, oh, I'll just feed the bear, and next thing you know, they got a dead person. Do you think um, are, are offenders watching these crime shows too to pick up ideas? Absolutely, offenders do watch crime shows, and and they do learn a lot from them. Uh, Ed Kemper was one, for example, became a prolific serial killer, and he said, "I watched the crime shows. I learned that you don't go to the funerals of your victims because the police are there taking pictures." Um, I learned that, he said, and so I didn't go to the funerals, even though I wanted to. Um, I was kind of curious about them. And, and, and yes, they do pick up. And, and again, you get some of these crumb shows that are based on true cases, and so they do give you a lot of good information about them. 
And it's like these copycat mass murders. We've seen a lot of mass murders in the United States, and we, we do know that the mass murders are learning from prior mass murders. Uh, for example, it used to be that mass murder was all at one, one time, at one place. Now we see more and more of them becoming bifurcated, where they'll commit a crime in one location, and then they'll commit another other series of murders in another location on the same day or within the next within an hour or so but to create a, a distraction and with those bifurcated murders um they've learned that uh, you can get a higher body counts if you do do it that way i've noticed that pattern too and that, that's been kind of concerning because i think i saw that originally on a, a tv show about five or ten years ago where they had arranged kind of just like you said distractions i think even the gentleman from the movie theater in colorado did the same thing Yes, they often sometimes they'll, they'll kill their mom or dad, then then they'll go off to the to the movie theater, or they'll kill someone in a downtown store, and then they'll go off to uh, uh, someone's home and kill everybody. So it's um, it is interesting how we see them thinking about this. Again, don't misunderstand me that a lot of people who commit mass murders are have mental illness. A lot of them do, uh, mental defects and so on. But uh, uh, none, nonetheless, there are those who are just angry men. And sometimes one of the angry men who want to act out, and so they commit these crimes uh, through stealth and through uh, understanding what the current uh, motif is. So, Dr. Hickey, if somebody wants to learn more information, get some more insight, contact you, where do they go? Well, um, they can contact me on my website. They can go to my website, erichickey.com, E R I C H. H I what is it? E R I C. Oh, I'm sorry, Eric E R I C H I C K E Y dot com. Um, you, I'm, I have no problem if you want to call me on my cell phone. I take calls 24 7, pretty much. Uh, 559 676 0711. I have no problem with people calling me. Uh, usually, if, if I don't pick up, just leave a message. And we usually will set up in time for an appointment. Um, I do recruit people from my programs at Align International University. We look for people who are interested in the dark side, not a purient interest, but, but a professional interest where they want to either get involved with law enforcement or corrections. They want to do investigations. They want to work with victims. Uh, and so we help people. We, we mentor people uh, down that path into the dark side. And, and there are wonderful careers there. Um, and if you can save someone's life. Tell, uh, trust me, it is well worth it. Thank you again, Dr. Hickey, for this. It was incredible insight. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope you really learned a lot in, these three, in this three-part series. I sure did. Remember, our motto is simple. Wherever there's psychology involved, we are there, no matter how dark it is. See you next time, everyone. <laughs>